So Sandy is the 10, one of the 10 most powerful women in tech. So my heavens. So I'm just going to say she's number one of the top 10. And she's here to talk to us. She is, she's got a long title as the general manager of the cloud ecosystem and developer and social media evangelist. And she's the author of three books. So, oh my heavens, we're so glad to have you here. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? I guess almost good afternoon, right? So I, oh, awesome, thank you, thanks, thanks. And I'll, I'll take a, our little selfie here in a moment too, okay? <laughs> so um, as uh, Beth said, I'm Sandy Carter, I'm with IBM. I've been with IBM for a pretty good while, but I have to tell you, I didn't start out studying computer science. I heard some of the, the great questions. I actually wanted to be a doctor. So I went to Duke University undergrad and I took all these pre-med classes and then we had to cut open these little baby rats with all the you know, smells, and I passed out. And I thought, oh shoot, it wasn't the blood, what was it? So we did the next assignment, and guess what, I passed out again. Now this isn't a good thing for a doctor, right? To pass out from all the medical smells. So I had to give up my dream of being a doctor, and what I did in undergrad is I got to write a paper, a thesis, about how to use computer science instead of doing drug testing on animals. We did computer science programs to test drugs using computers and techs instead. So that's actually how I got interested in tech and how I came to uh, really focus in this area. So what I thought I would do today is um, we've been focusing on different, what we call career hacks or success hacks. Uh, let me just get a feel for the room, and you guys may have already done this, but how many of you guys are in um, high school? High school or, okay, great. How many, that's awesome. How many of you guys are in college? You, almost, woohoo! And then how many of you guys are in the workforce? Okay, great, so we got a really good mix. So what I'll try to do is uh, share some examples that fit everybody today, because I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old daughter, uh, both of which who will come tonight to meet the astronauts, which we were so excited about, so we'll do that as well. Okay, so good, so let me, uh, let me see here. How do I click this? There we go. So there's a couple of uh, interesting factoids, I think, that are out there. So for all of us to know, so do you guys know what a VC is, a venture capitalist? They're the ones who fund a project. So if you're going to become an entrepreneur or take some of those great ideas that we saw over here. So there are only 6% VCs today in the world that are women. So we need more VCs. Yes, we do. Now, did you know that women entrepreneurs are actually 15% more profitable? Or smarter. I, there you go. I like it. We could just end right here, right? <laughs> but women entrepreneurs today are about 40% less likely to get funded. Does that make any sense to anybody? I'm a, I was a math computer science major. Those numbers just don't com compute. So this gap exists out there, and it's something that we all need to hone in and focus on to really change the game, right? So we're counting on you guys going up and you guys in the workforce to help us to change that game, because these numbers need to change. And um, so one of the things that we started looking at at IBM is to say, you know, what are some of the things that we could do to help entrepreneurs? Part of my job at IBM, I have like the coolest job at IBM. I've been to 87 different countries. I've eaten in McDonald's in every single one of them, by the way. My daughters love that. The healthy people don't, but. Um, and I get to work with entrepreneurs and VCs and ecosystems to help them grow. And a lot of stuff I do is I partner with folks like Elizabeth from Girls Who Code to help encourage new developers out there. So we put together what we call five career hacks. If you're not in a career yet, you can call them success hacks, if you would. And uh, what I would like to do today is just real briefly go through some of those and then hopefully take some questions. So the first one is to act like an open API. I'm assuming everyone in the room knows what an API is. If you don't, you better know. Thank you. you the gentleman in the back knows. Um, We're going to talk about this afternoon. You're going to talk about an API. OK, great. OK. Um, we're going to talk about showing your softer side. We're going to talk about being intentional about social. How many of you guys are tweeting today or Instagramming or pin? Okay, that's great. We're going to talk about homework is not a moot point, both for today or later, and then as well uh, why lifeline relationships really, really make a difference. So let's talk about hack number one, and that is acting like an open API. So an API, as you're going to learn, is a way that others can take advantage of a company's piece of code. 
It enables others to write into that code and then to be able to use whatever that capability is. Could be an object, could be something that's really, really interesting. And it's really cool because companies make a lot of money by opening up their APIs. They increase their revenue, they increase their reach because others are building on top of it, and they increase their innovation. Right, because people use that API in ways that you never ever expected before. So for a company to act like an API is really important, but it's also really important for all of us to also act like an open API. So just some quick factoids, um, about $31 billion is lost every year because people don't share information. That's a lot of money for companies. And as you're looking at success in college or in your career, the more that you share, the better off that you are. Now, I'll tell you a story. When I went to school, I got tested on memorizing stuff. But my daughter came home the other day, and I thought this was really cool. She's 13. And she could go and use Google or whatever tool she wanted to find the answers to questions. But what she had to do is prove that the answers that she found came from a trusted source someone who had that area of expertise, somebody who was really well known, that you could count on their answers. Because you guys all know, not everything on the internet is true, right? <laughs> so that was her assignment. Think about that. That's acting like an open API. You're sharing your knowledge. You're sharing that expertise as you go through. So acting like an open uh, API is a really important um, hack as you're sitting there thinking about you what is your, we call it a POV, what is your point of view? What are you great at? I loved um, this lady in the pink, I don't know your name, that showcased all these great, what's your first name? Kate. Kate. Oh my gosh, those were amazing examples. So she has a great point of view that she can share and become an expert. And by her giving back, she actually gets more. Not because she wants to get more, but because she's sharing her expertise, like she came here today. Um, you guys could write a weekly blog. Um, I was coaching some young girls the other day, and do you know that to get into one medical school, they actually ask you, have you already started a medical blog before you apply for medical school? So people are looking for that kind of thing. And then teaching others your tricks. Now, so since we've got such a broad range of folks in the room, um, you know, being an example, being a role model, being a mentor is acting like an open API. So one of the things that we advise everybody to do, but one of the things that men do better than women is to find a mentor or a coach as they, go, as they go forward. So I would encourage all of the young girls in here, you've got amazing women in the room, to ask one of them to be your mentor. And if you are um, in a place where you've got experience to volunteer your time to give back and to act as an open API to other young girls and what you need to do. So that's our hack number one, is acting like an open API. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Any quick questions on that? Yes? But how do you avoid being OK, so the question was, how do you avoid being taken advantage of? So it's something that you have to watch out for, but it, you need to look at your motivation for why you want to give your time up. So you don't have an unlimited amount of time, so you have to prioritize. But what I find is that a lot of people tend to think, in fact, there's books written about giving something away so you get something back. I think the opposite is true, that if you're doing something not to get something back, but just for good, you'll be able to prioritize and make sure that you're not being taken advantage of. But it is something good that you need to think about. Make sure that people aren't just coming to you to do their homework for them, right? It's to give them help, help and advice, because I had that happen with my daughter. Any other quick questions on this one? OK. So our, oh, our second one, let's go to number two, be intentional about your social media influence. And I think this one is really important. And I wanted to just show you something that most people don't know. So I work, I'm a general manager at IBM. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of women general managers, we, so we get to run a business. And as we're looking at businesses, we usually say, okay, what market should we go into? And we typically look at countries, right? So we had something in the past called the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Well, the report that just came out this year was really interesting because as they sized markets, and if you look up here, you can see that China and India are still really big markets for opportunity. But what do you notice next? What are the next markets? They're social networks. They're Facebook, they're Tencent, which is a network in China. 
uh, WhatsApp, their Google+, their LinkedIn, their Twitter. So the market is really changing and the way we look at it. So as you guys are creating new ideas or if you're an entrepreneur or even if you're a business leader, some of the things that you have to look at is you've got to look at things not just by geography anymore, but in a global sense and look at some of these social, these social areas. So if you're technical, one of the best places to go and hang out is GitHub and Stack Overflow. Have any of you guys ever been out there? Awesome. Yeah, most of all, all, all you, you guys have been out there too. You guys go out to Git and Stack. Perfect. So this is the number one place to go. And I just wanted to share an example of one of the young women who works for me. Um, she actually wrote a uh, mobile little piece of sample code. And she posted it out to uh, GitHub and Stack Overflow. She used video, so she used multimedia. And she's getting almost 2,000 people to come and leverage the code that she worked, that she used, so acting like an open API on the social network. So think about that. One piece of code, it's been downloaded about 2,000 times every month, unique downloads to be used and leveraged. So she's building up, as a young woman, she's building up her talent and her expertise in this area. And I'll give you one other quick story on this. Um, I was going to India, and before I got on the plane, I tweeted, I'm headed to India, and I'll be in Mumbai. When I showed up at Mumbai, it was 11 p.m. at night. For those of you who don't know, it's like a 22-hour flight to get there, so my mascara is dripping down my face. I don't look really great. I go to check in, and I want to go straight to sleep. But as I'm checking in, the manager of the hotel comes up to me, and he says, Ms. Carter, the party that you're meeting, uh, we moved them from this room down to another room because they got so big. I was like, oh wow, who's meeting me at 11 p.m. at night in Mumbai, India? Must be the IBM team, right, to greet me. So when I go down to the room, I open up the room and there's all this great Bollywood dancing going on, people having fun. There's like a, you know, 200 people in the room. Like, oh, this is a wedding. This is not for, you know, not, not me. So I walk back down and I said, excuse me, to the manager. Um, where is my party, right? He's like, I showed you. And I'm like, no, 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 there's people in there dancing and all that. So anyway, he walked me back down there. And this is a true, it's a true story. As I entered the room, this little gentleman comes running up to me and he's like, Sandy, Sandy. He goes, welcome. And I go, oh. So I'm like, shoot, I can't remember this guy's name. I, I don't even think I met him. I don't know. He knows my name. He's like, how are your girls? Oh, they're great. How's your dog? Wow, this guy really knows a lot about me. He's great. He goes, well, let me introduce myself. I am Anil, and I run the social media club in Mumbai. And we saw your tweet that you were coming, so we called the IBM office, and we asked if you had any time to meet with us, and they said, no, you didn't have any time, but they were happy to give me your hotel. And so I organized, I organized a meeting of the social media club to welcome you. So there are 200 people in the room. Remember, it's 11 p.m. at night. I've been trying, uh, flying for 22 hours. And they said, we hope that you brought your computer because we want you to lecture us on social. <laughs> really? So anyway, that was my big aha moment about the impact of social. Because what did that teach you? <laughs> no, that's not the lesson. <laughs> Although I don't tweet now, just to make sure. Um, but think about that. All these people had been following me on social media from India. So what did they feel? They felt like they knew me, right. right? They asked me about my daughters. They asked me about my dog, which is a really cute dog, by the way. They asked me about these things, and they wanted me to share my knowledge. They wanted me to act as an open API, and I actually stayed there with them until 2 in the morning. Um, sharing, you know, I, I brought my computer. I always bring my, my deck and, and taught them what I knew. It was a great experience for me because what it says is you need to be active and social. That is the new place. Um, you need to make sure that you're consistent and you know, that you're out there creating news, not just posting once and then waiting. And really understanding what matters on social. And for you young girls, what happens on social stays on social. All the new company, all companies today, I was just at a conference with the top Fortune 500, they all go to your Facebook page and they all look you up before they look at your resume. So make sure that what you have out there is something that you want to stay out there as well. So, so our second hack is to uh, really leverage social in your, in your workforce. Any questions on that one real quick? Social? Or hopefully you guys are all tweeting right now, right? I'm gonna go sit down, I'm gonna see lots of tweets. Okay, good, good. Okay, you notice on my chart, you see that uh, 
Sandy underscore Carter. This is a great this is a great thing though for all of you guys to do to build up your social influences when you speak to always leverage your social handles, right? Whether Twitter or, or Pinterest or anything like that as well. Okay. <clears throat> Hack number three is to win the hard sale, you've got to show your soft side. Now this is a lesson that when I grew up, no one taught me. In fact, they told me the opposite. You've got to be tough, right? You've got to act like the guys. You've got to dress like the guys. You can see I don't do that. But you've got, you know, you've got to, you can't show that soft side. You just can't do it. But all the research actually shows that showing that soft side and networking and getting to know people is actually more beneficial than being really super tough. And this is just one example. If you're looking for a job, 70% of jobs today come through networking. And that means that you've shown your soft side because you're friends with somebody, you're colleagues with somebody, you've made a connection with Kate through her amazing uh, inventions so that you've leveraged that, that soft side. You're not just showing that toughness. And I'll, sh I'll give you another story. You can tell I love telling stories. <clears throat> One of the stories I love is I was um, asked to come into a really technical group at IBM and I was going to be manager of this group and the group wasn't performing so they weren't getting the work done in the right way and they were very unhappy so they weren't motivated. So they gave me this really tough group. <clears throat> they happened to be all men. So when I came in, I, said, I thought, well, they're not communicating. That might be part of the problem. So I set up a weekly meeting so we could talk and do a huddle. And then I thought, you know what? I love quotes. What I'm going to do is every Monday before the, the huddle is I'm going to put a quote on their desk, and it's going to be specific to them. So I spent a lot of time doing this. On Sundays, I would go through and I'd find quotes, and I'd give it for each person and make it very specific. Well, one day, after about three weeks of getting these quotes, this really big guy who worked for me, he comes into my office, and he slams the door, kaboom, and he says, look, <clears throat> These quotes, we don't like them. They're really girly girl, and we're not. So quit doing them. And then he turned around and he walked back out the door. So I thought, shoot, what should I do, you know? They are girly girl. Oh, wait a second, I am a girl. That's okay. And I thought, you know, I think it, it helps them to see who I am, and it helps them to see who I think they are. So I'm gonna continue to do it. So <clears throat> fast forward, we turned around the group. We made it very successful. I actually won the Manager of the Year Award that year for being the best people manager at, at IBM in this group. But this gentleman was retiring. He invited me to his retirement lunch. So when I come in, they sit me down beside his wife. And I said, hi, I'm Sandy. She goes, oh, you're the woman with the quotes. I'm like, I know that your husband didn't like that. I'm really sorry, but I had to do it. And she's like, what are you talking about? He has a shoebox. And he put every one of your quotes in the shoebox. So for the two years he worked for you, he's got about 100 quotes in that shoebox. And it's like his prized possession. He takes them out. In fact, one of the things his daughter gave him is a more permanent box so he can keep those quotes in that permanent box. Now, it's interesting, right? Because that was showing my soft side and something that he even said, don't do it because it's girly girl. But because I showed who I really was, not try to act like somebody else, it made a difference and an impact. So make sure that you guys are acting like yourselves and dressing like yourselves, being collaborative, doing the right things, focusing on value, and showing a personal interest in people. It really does make a difference, and don't let anybody tell you to act like someone that you're not, because it won't work, right? All those people are taken. You're the only one who can take yourself. Any questions on this one? Make sense? Is this helpful for you guys? Yes. Good? Okay, okay. Okay, so hack number four that I have is um, homework is not a MOOC point. So first of all, you probably thought that once you get out of school, your homework goes away, but it doesn't. Um, do all of you guys know what a MOOC is? Okay, okay. So I, it's a massive online class. So they're uh, really popular today. We do them around our IBM technology. We do MOOCs. So it's kind of a play on words, right? Homework is not a MOOC point or a MOOC point. And I think this is really important because if you look at the studies, it shows that the way that you demonstrate success when you get into the workforce or when you're an entrepreneur is through those media assignments. It's taking the risk, having a P&L responsibility, profit and loss responsibility, where you're responsible for a business. So it's being able to get out there and take a risk and doing your homework so that you are looking at things like 
you know, the financials, um, the business value, the business vision, where you're headed. And if you look at some of the differences between men and women, most women, when they're mentored, they're mentored on their personal attributes. They're mentored on how to get along with others, those two. But the third, which is called the missing 33%, this media assignment, this understanding the business, understanding the financials, even if you're an entrepreneur, you need to understand that, um, that missing 33% can cause you to miss out on some really great things. So don't shy away from doing the homework, doing the hard stuff, make sure that you get in there and you're doing some of that stuff as well. So checklist here is make sure you look at your skills and even if you're technical, you've got some of those technical skills, also make sure you're looking at storytelling. You know, if you think about data scientists today, a big gap in technology, data scientists combined with storytelling is the number one highest rising salaries over the next five years. So it's not just having the technology of data scientists, but also understanding how to tell a story around it. So make sure you're looking at all the skills that are required to be successful, not just the technical ones, or if you're, not, if you're shying away from technical, don't just look at the soft skills, look at the great combination of each. Okay, any questions on that? Making sure that you're preparing, yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the data science term is, gets thrown a lot, a lot, and it's like the hot new thing, but could you tell us what it was called before a couple of years ago? Because it seems like this is something that's been around for decades, if, if not longer. If, yeah, yeah so um, I think it's really grown in popularity recently because you know, one of my favorite quotes, again, is uh, you know, data is like oil. It's everywhere now. There's so much data. Analytics is like refining the oil, right? You, there's really no value in straight oil. I, I used to live in Texas. I'm, I'm a Texan. Just the oil by itself doesn't have any value. You get value from the oil when you refine the oil. And that's going and looking at the analytics behind it. And that's what a data scientist does. Uh, in the past, they may be called someone who focuses on analytics or focuses on big data. But really, in essence, a data scientist is being able to extract the, the value from the data. And one of the really cool things is that a lot of people can extract it, but then they can't tell the story to the board of directors, to their VC, to get the funding. So they can extract the value, but then they don't know how to communicate the value. So folks like, yeah, it's a, yeah, so folks like NYU, um, who we partner with here in New York, they actually have a class now that I love because what they do is they combine storytelling with data science and then they actually put you out in the wild so you get to work for real companies in New York City so you can practice your skills and really hone them. So I believe in the future one of these top skills that will be out there will be this data scientist combined with storytelling skill. And I think that's just gonna grow and grow and grow, especially with cognitive computing and machine learning coming. It's just gonna grow even bigger. Art and science, that's a great way to say it. Yeah, tweet that, that was great, I love that. I love that, thank you. Okay, uh, so, so that's the homework side, so do your homework, make sure that you've got those skills and that subject matter expertise. Any questions on this? Making sure you're prepared. You know, yesterday I had a big client meeting and I practiced, you know, and that's homework, right? Because you're practicing, you wanna make sure it goes well, you wouldn't show up for a multi-million dollar deal without practicing. So. You know, even here, right? Even here, I practice before I come to speak to you guys because I care about you. I want to do the best job that I can. So keep that ethic up as well as you move forward. Make sense? Okay. Last one. There we go. Is um, lifelong relationships are the breakaway play. And this is one really wish when I was a kid someone had taught me. So this is one I really wanted to share with you. Um, so, you know, this is really about you never know when that relationship is going to come back. You never know, you know, like I've gotten to know Elizabeth, who's done an amazing job. I don't know uh, if you guys gave her a big round of applause for this space app. Did you? Okay, let's do it again. So, you know, we've, we've started our relationship, and I, I love working with her, and I want to keep that relationship going and growing. So think about when you meet people, you know, a lot of people think about, okay, what can I get from this right now? Almost like a transactional thing versus what can I give to this relationship? What do I have to offer? 
to give to this relationship because that's really what makes a relationship long-term. The relationship never, never ever survives when it's one-sided. It's got to be multiple. Um, this is one of our um, studies that we've done at IBM, and it's, advanced, it's called Advancing Women. We looked at about um, 3,800 women, not just in IBM, but from our customers and partners, and we found, you see, the number one thing to advance is having that right opportunity, so doing that media assignment, but number two is your network building those relationships up over time. And uh, I had a task once, I've read about 50 books of successful people, and there's only one thing that every one of them have in their books about how to succeed, and that is build up networks, build a career advisory board, have people around you that are like your board of directors so that you can succeed and you can go forward. <clears throat> so if you look at this and you think about it, I'll give you an example that you never know. <clears throat> There was this gentleman, his name is Jeffrey Gittimore. I don't know if you guys know him, but he has written more best-selling business books than anybody in the history of writing. It's, Jeff, it's Jeffrey Gittimore, G-I-T-O-M-E-R. He wrote The Little Red Book of Sales. He's written a book on networking. He's, he's amazing. So I went to this conference, and um, I noticed that you know nobody sits in the front row, right? Have you ever noticed that? So I thought, you know, I'm a speaker. I really like people to sit in the front row to give me that visual contact. It makes me really jazz. Yeah, so I'm going to do that for him. I don't know him, but I'm going to go sit in the front row. So I went and I sat in the front row, and I was tweeting the whole time, right? So I'm a I'm big social evangelist, so I'm sitting there tweeting and. Pinterest and Instagram, the whole nine yards. So afterwards, he comes up to me. He goes, hey, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, shoot. So the first thing I said was, I wasn't, I wasn't doing my mail. I was actually taking your thoughts and putting them on, on social, right? And he goes, oh, I know that. I just wanted to thank you for sitting in the front row because it really helped me out. And yeah, he's a great speaker. But he said, I really love that. I really appreciate that very much. Um, and he gave me his card. I gave him his card. The next day, I get this email. And it said in the subject line, holy wow. Now, would you open that email? Oh, yeah. I mean, out of the 500 emails I get a day, I open that email. And he said to me, you know, I was really, I, I was really touched that you sat in the front row for me, so I want to do something for you. And so I was like, wow, that's really nice. I didn't sit in the front row for you to do that, but we started this relationship. I've written four books now. I wrote one on a technology called SOA. And he actually endorsed my book, which as a, you know, as a best-selling author, having a best-selling author endorse your book, pretty darn amazing. And that really, and I still, you know, I still go and have lunch with him. That would never have happened if I didn't sit in that front row and take seriously that relationship. I didn't do it to get that endorsement. I did it because I wanted to help him authentically. But because I thought about the relationship not as a transaction, but as something lifelong, made a big difference. So um, network, network, network. You know, this is a great place today and tomorrow. Tomorrow you're gonna see me with my two daughters as well. You know, network, create a career advisory board. You're never too young or too old to do that. And that means get people who can help advise you about science and, and you know, all different types of things and make sure that you have men on the board. So I see some men in here, grab them afterwards on the arm and just ask them, I see this one gentleman here with a New York hat on, terrified, and say, will you be part of my career advisory board? Because you need men as allies as you move forward, right? Diversity breeds innovation, so we want to make sure we do that. And then be present and engage. And I always tell this to young kids. I talk, uh, just talked to a group of about 1,000 millennials, and uh, one of the questions they asked me as they were doing this, they are like, Sandy, could you, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, look up. I mean, you know, there is a time to tweet, but don't just look at your device. When you're, when you're with people, be present. Don't just sit there and text the whole time. Be present with them and engage them, and that's the way that you're going to form these lifelong relationships. Okay, so that, that was our little, um, our little checklist. Act like an open API, so share your talent. Um, to win the hard sale, show your soft side. Be intentional about your social influence. Homework is not a MOOC point, and these lifelong relationships are really, really, really important. And if I could just tell one last quick story. Um, I, have a, I have my daughter who, uh, I forget, I think it was this young lady right over here. She came home, she got selected for a special math class, and she said, Mom, I'll do anything if I don't have to take that class. You tell me. You want me to do your laundry for the year, whatever you want. I'll cook dinner every night, whatever. I will not go to the class. I said, well, you're going to go to the class. So tell me why you don't want to go to the class. 
So I found out a lot of things like you, like you had just talked about, right? There was only two girls in the class. Um, the guys in the class weren't the coolest guys in the class. And so it was kind of like a thing not, you know, to be in this class. So uh, one of the things that I did for my daughter was I went and found this really super cool, we have 11 math teachers at our high school. Went and found one woman who was a math teacher, super cool, and I got her to mentor my daughter, to be a role model for my daughter, and to give her strength and courage as she went into that class. She is taking the class now. In fact, in the, in the book we have, I think I have it in here, there's a free, yeah. You see that called, it's called Geek Girls Are Chic. Well, yeah, there's a, if you click that link, I don't know how, do they get a copy of these? Send a copy, okay, and I'll also tweet it out, but there's this little book called Geek Girls with Chic, I, it's, it's seven career hacks, and I included my daughter's story in there because I wanted her to know she's not the only one, she's now brave, she's raising her hand even though she gets made fun of, which she does, um, and that she could be a role model to other girls as well. So I, I wanted to tell you that story because I know having two teenage daughters what this is like. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks. So here's my huge takeaway from this. Data and storytelling. Oh, what are you here for today? Data and storytelling. You're going to make lots of money. And you can remember that you started here. And just, you know, you can thank NASA in the future. Like, I'm making gazillions oh, because NASA had this. Love to take credit. Um, we are going to take, that was awesome, Sandy. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to see those charts and be able to really ruminate over them and click on things. Um, we're going to take a break until 1.15. I know it's going to be hard to gather you back up again, but right after, so the food's out there. You can come back and eat here. After we come back, we're going to have the mentors stand up and talk about what's going to happen in the afternoon. So we want to give him, we want to give you a chance to be with them. And just so you know, we're going to have some setup where you can talk about different topics, and the mentors will tell you what that is. You don't have to just stick with one. You can flit around and you know until you find the one that really you know makes you excited, or they all do. Um, so that's going to be the afternoon, and hopefully we'll carve out some time for questions for the things that we didn't get a chance to talk about. We'll see how, or you may just want to stay in your groups. We'll see how that works. So thank you all the panelists for this morning. It's wonderful. We'll be playing some drums and piano for music in the background <laughs> for lunch. And let's, oh, there you go. <laughs> all right, thank you all. <laughs>